Welcome back to the Band Guide, where we use Garage Band to create professional sounded music. I'm your band guide, Colin, and today is another video in the Ultimate Garage Band Beginner Guide series, where we're going through everything from the first time you open up Garage Band to export out your finished, mixed, and mastered song. And today we are actually looking at EQ during the mixing process. So if you've been following along, you know we recorded a song together. Now we're mixing a song together, and in a little bit we're going to be mastering a song together. So stick around for that coming up, and go check out the other videos if you haven't already seen them. But today we're talking all about EQ. EQ, which is the most powerful tool you have in mixing in terms of developing the tone of your song, which I think we can all agree getting a good tone in our song is important, right? Okay, so before we get into today's video, I also have something I want to give you. I've also put together the ultimate garage band guide. This guide walks through everything from recording, mixing, mastering, gear you need, shortcuts, all that stuff, and it's completely free from the link in the description below. So be sure to pick that up. There's actually a really helpful EQ cheat sheet built into that guide. So download that. That's going to help you when it comes time to EQ in your mix. But let's go and get into today's video where we're going to EQ the song that we've been working on together. So EQ is a tool that allows us to just shape the tone in our mix. We have three goals when working with EQ. We want to minimize the bad, so kind of minimize things that we don't like, highlight the good, things that help it cut through in the mix that we like the sound of, and then make space for every source because your song likely has multiple elements going on in it and you can't have everything be huge and full. You need to kind of make space so everything can fit together in the mix. So those are our three goals with EQ. Now we're gonna go through in this video and actually EQ this song together. So you'll get to see me go through this across the entire mix and I'll walk through some of the decisions I'm making while I'm making them. But EQ is a huge tool. I've actually developed an entire course built around it. I'll link to that below if you're interested. No pressure, we're gonna get deep into EQ in this video today as well. But before we get into it, let's fast forward to the end of this video and listen to the before and after of this song with EQ on it so you can hear how much impact it really has on the mixing process. Check it out. Okay, so let's listen to it. Now, the other day we exported out our static mix, our mix with just volumes and panning, and now we can use that as a guide to compare our mix after EQ to what it sounded like before EQ. So let's listen to the mix before EQ, and then when I turn this off, it will be after EQ. Let's check it out. So this is no EQ. Pretty crazy, right? Okay, so now that you know how much impact that really had on the mix, let's go through and look at EQ first, and then we're gonna go through and actually apply it to each individual track. So let's just break down an EQ really quickly first. So EQ is broken out into three types of tools. You have a bell, this looks like a bell, pretty obvious, and you can boost and cut with a bell. So there's only two moves you can do with an EQ, you can boost or you can cut. Then you have a shelf, a shelf you can boost or cut with. A shelf is just going to boost from this point and above on the frequency spectrum, or if you do a low shelf from this point and below. So that's our second type. And then our third type is what's called a filter. And a filter is just going to completely cut out anything from the point you set here and below, or if you do a high cut filter, it's gonna cut out everything from here and above. So those are three types of moves. Now, as I mentioned, with the bell and shelf, you can either boost or cut with them. And that's gonna be really helpful and you'll see how we'll use that throughout. But just simplify it and think about on your car stereo, you can turn up the bass, mids, and treble on your car stereo. It's the same kind of thing here. The only thing that's fully different here is that you get more access to which specific parts of the bass, mids, and treble, and you can filter out, just completely remove parts of sound, which can be really helpful to clean up your mix and make everything fit together in it. And then lastly, we have a frequency that spans from 20 hertz at the bottom here, all the way up to 20,000 hertz. So 20 hertz is like super sub frequencies, low end frequencies like that hit you in your chest. 20,000 hertz is where it's super bright and crispy. Now 20,000 hertz, we actually start losing hearing from the top down as we age. So there's a good chance you can't actually hear 20,000 hertz, but just you can still perceive it a little bit most of the time. You just might not be able to really specifically pick up on those specific frequencies. But anything here, 8K and above, is like the really, really bright high end frequencies. And then on this EQ, at least built into GarageBand, you also have a frequency analyzer, which allows us to see what's actually going on here. I turn this on. 
but you don't want to rely on this, but you'll see how I use that very specifically at a few points throughout this mix. And then the very last thing you need to know is that you can boost or turn down the output volume. So because an EQ is adding or taking away volume throughout it, so I'm specifically adding volume to these frequencies, I can add volume to a source, which can throw off my mix because I spent time getting my mix all ready, right? So if you do a lot of boosts, you might need to do a little bit of a cut on the output to make sure you're not adding volume, throwing off your mix, and uh, tricking your ears into thinking you like it better just because you made it louder. Our ears tend to prefer louder things. So let's go and set these back to zero. I'm actually just gonna turn the CQ off because this was just for demonstration purposes. And now we're gonna go back over to tracks and we're gonna start EQing on individual tracks. Now, I can't stress this enough you should only be EQing for something that's going to help the mix as a whole. It does not matter what it sounds like in solo. It matters what it sounds like altogether. So I don't care if that guitar sounds a little bit muddy in solo, if it sounds good when everything is together. But you can go in and out of solo to help you find specific things. Or if you're like, I can tell something's off here, but I'm not exactly sure what, going into solo can help with that. So I have no problem going to solo. I go into solo regularly, and you'll see me do it throughout this video. But you should always be thinking in the context of the mix, what do you need? So let's just start with these drums and then we'll move down through this mix together. So starting with these drums, let's listen for a minute and let's talk about what we might need with EQ here. Okay, so what I hear is that I just want a little bit more super low end impact out of my kick drum. I want a little bit more crack out of my snare drum and I also want my snare drum to have a little bit more body. Uh, and I'm also thinking about my mix as a whole and knowing that my bass ultimately is gonna be my primary low end source. And so I wanna make a little bit of space for that as well. So let's start by making a little bit of space by using a filter here to just cut out a little bit of the low end frequencies, nothing that's making us lose something about this drum kit, but just to make sure that we have a little extra space down in the super low end for the bass guitar. Let's listen in solo here to hear that. So this filter, as I pull it up, starts to get really thin, right? We don't wanna be losing anything for our goal today right now, at least. So I'm just gonna bring it up to around here where I still feel like I'm hearing the kick drum as I want to, but I'm making a little bit of extra space in the super low end for the bass guitar. Okay, the second thing I wanna do is add a little bit more low end impact to my kick drum. So let's find a point for that. Now, this is where uh, the frequency analyzer can be helpful. What you're looking for is the lowest point of sound when the kick drum is hitting. So this is what's called the fundamental. And it looks like it's somewhere around this range here. So now let's use our ears and find a specific frequency. And we'll boost like crazy to find it. Let's listen in the context of the mix and see what sounds good with everything else. So we're right around there feels pretty good to me. All right, now let's make it a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, that feels better. There's just a little bit more low-end impact from that kick drum. You might not be able to hear it if you're not wearing headphones, but with headphones, you can definitely hear it. All right, let's uh, just take a second and try to find, I want a little more body on the snare drum as well. So again, I can see that snare drum hits. That's the lowest point that the snare drum hits there. So if I do just a little bit of boost around that. Okay, just trying to find where it sounds good with everything else. It only matters that it works with the whole mix, right? What have I done? A little bit higher than I might have done just looking at the frequency spectrum. Somewhere right around 200 sounded best in the mix for me. Really subtle there. All right, let's try to bring out a little more crack of the snare. Get no work done all day long. That's gonna come up here in this like presence range. It starts to feel almost like tinny to me up here. I like the sound of it around here. What? 
And in terms of width, because you can adjust how wide these are, I can make them really narrow, really wide. You just wanna be making sure that you're only impacting the frequencies you wanna impact. And not, a super wide is gonna impact a bunch of frequencies. Maybe you want that, but a lot of times you're just looking in a specific area. So I try to go as narrow as I can, but as wide as will get me the sound that I'm looking for. Very, very rarely, I should say though, are you gonna do something super narrow. I, I would say, unless you're specifically trying to cut out a ring or something, don't do a really, really narrow cut. Uh, okay, or boost. Okay, and then the last thing is now I'm hearing like a little bit of woofiness on the kick drum. So let's find one more EQ point here. Okay, uh, <laughs> that was a weird sound. We're just gonna take this and I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be down in the low end. Let's see if we can find it. I think it's gonna be somewhere in this range here. Let's listen to this in solo and I want to show you, let's first actually balance the volume out off and on really quick. I'm adding just a little bit of volume, so I'm going to do a very small reduction over here on the output. And then let's listen before and after to these drums. So this is before uh, with EQ and then when I take it off. Little more crack to the snare, a little bit more low into the kick drum. Listen to how the snare uh, cuts through the mix a little bit better. The kick drum has a little bit more impact in the mix when this is on, this is off. Right, very small moves. I think I could bring up the body of the snare a little bit here. I'm good with where the kick drum is. I want a little more body out of that snare though. Right, okay. So subtle moves, but they add up. And you'll see, you already heard at the very beginning of this that the sum is bigger than the individual parts, right? Okay, let's look at the grit track really quickly here. So this is our distortion track. And I'm actually gonna add a fresh EQ after the pedal board. If you saw my video on uh, production elements, we dialed this in there. So what I'm looking for here is to just bring out a little more of that snare sound. So I just wanna find where this snare sounds good on this track. Somewhere around there feels good to me. Very small reduction here. Cool, okay. Very subtle EQ on that, but again, the sum of the parts is gonna be huge. Okay, first little extra bonus tip is that you don't need to EQ everything. So for example, I don't need to EQ this tambourine. It's doing what I want it to. I don't need to EQ this bass bomb. It's doing what I want it to, same with the swell. So we're gonna jump up to the bass guitar now. And with bass guitar, you gotta trust your ears and find what you need in the context of your song. But I know in this song, I probably want a little bit more low end and then a little bit more of it cutting through in the mix. But let's listen to it and see what we think. Let's listen in the verse and see if we agree. I can hear it better in the verse. But I'm losing a little bit in the chorus. So what I wanna focus on is bringing out the low end, which is gonna come down here in the super sub range and just start at the low end range right here. And we're just gonna play around until we find the right frequency for that. I'm gonna set a high pass filter here just to make sure it doesn't extend on forever to where I can't actually hear it. This helps me keep a tighter, cleaner low end. If you're listening on good headphones, you can already hear that's adding a lot of low end there. If I take this off. And then let's find where it cuts through a little bit more. This is typically around 1K on a bass guitar. 
So let's listen to this here. Let's listen to the context. Right around 1K, just above 1K there. So I'm gonna make that a little bit smaller, mirror, a little bit smaller. Bring this down a little bit, output volume. All right, let's listen in the context. Let's start in this verse here. So this is off, this is on. You just feel the low end more right there. Same in the chorus here. Cool. Okay, let's look at electric guitars here. So with electric guitars, uh, it varies, but one of the biggest places that I make space for other sources with electric guitars is to cut out the uh, super low frequencies for the bass and the super high frequencies for the uh, kind of vocals or acoustic guitars or cymbals. That's what I really want up in these super high frequencies up here. And I find that on an electric guitar, they're often just kind of fizzy. So I can cut them out. I'm not necessarily losing anything. So let's start by just cutting that down a little bit. I'm gonna do this in solo to make sure I don't get into what I like about the sound. Okay, that helps a little bit for sure. Let's cut out some of the low end too for the bass and kick. So this already just contains the sound a little bit. Takes away a little bit of that fuzz up top. A little bit of the muddiness down in the bottom. Okay, now in the context, let's listen and see what else we might want out of this guitar sound. Okay, so I think I want a little more warmth out of this and I also want a little more presence out of this. Now, again, on that guide that I mentioned at the beginning, I have a little cheat sheet that shows you where you can find warm, warm frequencies and tinny frequencies and boxy frequencies and presence and body and all that stuff. So definitely check out that guide. This will help you when you're making your EQ decisions. So thinking through this, I want this to be a little bit of a warmer guitar tone and I want it to cut through the mix a little bit more. So warmth is gonna come from down here and then cutting through the mix is gonna come up here in like the presence frequencies. So let's listen to the context of the mix here and find where warm frequencies were. I like it right around there. Somewhere right around 300 is working for me. So let's scale this back. Let's also make it a little bit narrower. It's subtle, but it's really filling out that guitar right there. Let's find a little bit of presence here now. So let's figure out where this works in the context of the mix. What frequencies sound good in the context of everything? On this guitar, I like it somewhere around like three and a half, almost 4,000 hertz here. So you see 3,000, 4,000 hertz. Little bit. Okay, let's reduce the volume a little bit since we've added with two boosts here. We have cut a little bit of the frequencies out, so I don't necessarily need to take it out all the way and make it totally like super reduced, but just a little bit to where it sounds like it's the same volume. Let's see how much fuller and more balanced this sounds with EQ on. This is like a little bit thin. This is fuller and more present. Cool, okay, now I'm gonna follow that same approach for the other two electric guitars, so I'm gonna skip ahead just to save a little bit of time here, and then we'll come back for acoustic guitars. Okay, so got the, the electric guitars here. Uh, again, as you can see, very similar moves. 
And now let's listen to these acoustics. Now with acoustics, again, you gotta be thinking with everything, what role is it serving in the mix? So uh, the way I might EQ an acoustic guitar in the context of a bigger rock mix is gonna be different than a singer-songwriter acoustic guitar. Uh, with a singer-songwriter, you want a big full sound, but you could end up with a very similar looking EQ to me. It just depends. So you got to use your ears and you got to think about what you want. So what I want from this acoustic guitar is for it to add a little bit of warmth and then also add a fair amount of just like the rhythmic element. So these acoustics are doing this very rhythmic strumming here. And I want that to cut through. I think it's already cutting through pretty well. But I'm going to see if I can bring it out just a little bit more in the context of the mix. So... I want to make sure I still have warmth, but I don't have anything wonky, anything that I don't like. So minimizing the bad. And then I also want to clean out a little bit of low end space for electric guitars or the, the bass guitar, I mean. Uh, so let's look, starting with that. You see how it's just kind of like hittering around down here a little bit. We just want to cut that out completely. And I'll do this in solo to find, make sure I'm not getting in the way of something I like. So initially I started to cut here, but I want the warmth that's coming in around 100 hertz. So somewhere around there is working pretty well for me. On some acoustics, I might cut all the way up to here in a rock mix just to make space for those lower mid-range frequencies for the electric guitars or something. Okay, let's listen here. This is working, okay. I feel like I hear a little bit of a ring. Let me turn this volume up here just a little bit for you. So I'm at negative 13. Okay, you notice as I went over right around 400, you kind of hear like a ring jump out at you. Let's cut that out just a little bit. I feel like I still hear a bit of a lower ring. A little bit more here. Okay, when I turn this off, notice how you hear that ring come in. So this is on. When I turn this off, you'll hear a ring pop up. And this addresses it. To exaggerate it here for you, this is what that ring sounds like. You can hear it just a little bit. and then it goes away when I turn that EQ on. So that's minimizing the bad at its finest. I'm cutting out a ring pretty aggressively there. And then let's see if we can find something in the context in the mix that helps it cut through just a little bit more. So I'm keeping a fair amount of this warmth. I'm just getting rid of, rid of something, minimizing the bad here that I don't like right here. And let's see if we can find something upper in these upper frequencies. Now this acoustic to me feels almost thin, almost brittle up in these like super bright frequencies. Some acoustics don't, and you gotta give them a pretty good shelf up here, uh, kind of like this to help them have that brightness. I don't think I need that, but I do feel like I could maybe benefit from something up here in the, the upper bright, upper mids presence range. So let's try to find that in the context of the mix. Okay, for me, that kind of jumped out at me immediately right when I went over it. Down here, it felt kind of harsh. Up here, it felt kind of, I don't know, weird. And as soon as I hit this sweet spot, it immediately was like, that's what I'm looking for to bring out just a little bit more of. Listen to it as I pan across those frequencies in this context. Let's go back to the start of this course. Uh, a little bit harsh around here. Feels pretty good. Pretty good still. No good. So I'm looking for something right around here. Let's try to find the exact spot. Right around there. Okay, now I brought the volume of this quite up quite a bit. I think it was 13.4 if I remember correctly. So we'll bring that back down. So 
So notice this, I'll bring it back up for just one second. Notice we have that ring. This addresses that ring and it makes it just a little bit brighter in a way that's gonna help it cut through in this mix. Okay, I also think these could come up a little bit from where they are right now. I'm gonna bring them up three decibels from where they were, which is a pretty good amount. Let's see. If we're okay. Let's listen in the intro. Okay, I think I like that pretty well. Uh, okay, so. That is how I approach acoustics. I'm going to go ahead and EQ the other acoustic. Very likely that it's going to be the exact same settings. Uh, so sometimes what I'll do if it's literally the same, in this case it was the exact same mic, exact same acoustic, I can copy and go down to this other acoustic and go up here to paste. But let me listen to that really quickly. I'll go and fast forward through this and then we'll come back and work on the vocals together. Okay, so got those acoustics. I will say I split the difference volume wise. I ended up turning them back down just a little bit from where I brought them up to. But this is a good example of how, yes, you get all your volumes right in the static mix, but you can tweak things a little bit as you go, which is why I don't automate until the very end on volumes. That way, if I need to just adjust that acoustic a little bit, I can keep tweaking it and massaging it. So by the end of the mix, I feel like everything's really in their exact right place. Okay, let's talk about vocals really quick. So vocals, they can be tricky, but ultimately you want to do as little as you can, but as much as you need to, because a vocal is a very natural source and you don't want to overdo it. But different frequencies can build up because of the microphone or the room. So we're going to try to address that a little bit on this vocal recording. So uh, let's start by just listening to it and seeing what we think this vocal needs. <laughs> Okay, so my initial impression from that vocal is that it sounds a little bit boxy. So again, go check out that sheet and see if you can find like the boxy area. And I think it could have a little bit more uh, like warmth to it, uh, which is gonna come down to like the low mids, low end area, and then a little bit more present. So the boxiness is what's kind of helping it cut through the mix right now. And on this case, at least, it might be a little bit higher than some. It's almost like a nasally sound. But there's something right around here that's not working for me, I think. Let's listen to that verse again. Lose this one all day long. So let's start by just cutting out things we don't need. So we'll do a high pass filter here. I get no work done all day long. I get what have I done? Let's try to bring in a little bit more warmth. I'm again going to do this in the context of the mix. Okay, so notice how much more warmer this vocal sounds. Turn this off. Alright, let's listen through like the frequency range right above it here. I think that's where I'm hearing that boxiness. I'm gonna try to just cut that just a little bit. And let's see if we can bring out a little bit more presence here. So on this vocal, I'm really liking around 3K there, but with a pretty wide boost, so I'm getting some all the way down to about 1K almost, and then up into the 6K range. And then we have the super bright frequencies up here. Okay, gonna turn it down just a little bit because we're adding some volume. And let's listen to this off and on. So this is off. So in solo here, listen for how it gets fuller and uh, a little bit more present and up front. 
and a little less boxy. Lost my last job, can't lose so this is this on. One all day long, I get no work done. All day long, I get what have I done? Okay, now vocal EQ can really be broken down into a few steps. I'm gonna link to a video I've done above here specifically on vocal EQ. It's a whole video just on vocal EQ, so definitely go check that out. Uh, and in fact, I'll also say that I've done an entire vocal mixing series that just focuses on vocals that I think is a great complement to what we're gonna do in this series because we're gonna focus on the entire song here, but you gotta focus on vocals some too. So while I'll cover everything on vocals, I can't go as in depth as I did in that series. So that video is part of that series. So check out that video and then you can see the series around it as well. Okay, so uh, the only let's talk about backing vocals a little bit here, and then I'll do the same thing where I fast forward through doing all of them. But backing vocals, I'm basically doing the same thing, but I'm kind of taking the opposite approach. I want them to be present, but at the same time, I don't want them to get in the exact same space as the lead vocal. So it's pretty common for me that I won't mix them quite as bright as the lead vocal, but I might bring out a little more presence depending on how they're recorded. So listening to this vocal here, this is our double on the lead vocal. Let's cut out this low end that we don't need. And what I what jumps out at me initially is that it feels a little bit muddy uh, and kind of boxy. Let's listen around here. Yeah. Right around there. I think if I just cut that a little bit and then give it a little bit more presence. Let's find this in the context here. I'm gonna make this a little bit narrower. Somewhere around there is feeling pretty good to me, so about 3K again. It's a little bit more balanced sounding. And then I'm actually going to make it a little bit darker in the super bright frequencies so that that space can be reserved for the lead vocal. And just look at the input output. I think we're about the same off and on because I've done boosts and cuts. I actually think I've lost a little bit of volume, so I'm gonna add a little bit of volume on the output over here. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the rest of these vocals here and then we'll come back and we will listen through the entire mix together and see the before and after. Okay, so let's listen to it. Now, the other day we exported out our static mix, so our mix with just volumes and panning, and now we can use that as a guide to compare our mix after EQ to what it sounded like before EQ. So let's listen to the mix before EQ, and then when I turn this off, it will be after EQ. Let's check it out. So this is no EQ. Right, it's a lot fuller, it's a lot uh, more present, it's more upfront. There might be a little bit of volume difference here and there just because of all the EQ we applied across the tracks, which is one reason you wanna keep a good amount of headroom at the top of your mix when you're setting your volumes. But overall, that's just coming from getting the tones right and slowly and in small subtle moves, making more space in our mix, highlighting the good and minimizing the bad. And you do that and you get a fuller, louder, more present, more upfront sound. Okay, so that's EQ. EQ. Again, grab the Ultimate Garage Band guide from the link in the description below. It has an EQ cheat sheet built into it. It's really going to help you out. And before you go, I'd love to hear from you. Have you been using EQ or have you been using presets or have you just been avoiding it altogether? Let me know in the comments below. I'll just say you can't really use presets unless you're going for like a telephone effect or something because presets don't know what your audio sounds like. So how does it know how it needs to fit together in your mix? So it's important that you learn how to use EQ. As I mentioned, I've done an entire course just on it, but it's also part of my Ultimate GarageBand mixing course. But just with what we've covered today, you can definitely get going with EQ in your mix. So let me know in the comments below if you've been using EQ or if you've been avoiding. I'd love to hear from you. If this video was helpful, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow where we're gonna start applying compression to this mix. One thing